Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. It's the last week of 2020, and boy, what a year it has been. While I don't think I coined the term military murder, I never thought there would be so many military murders in one year. But 2020 has proven to be the year to bring military murders to the forefront, garnering enough attention that the likes of Nancy Grace, Dateline, and many other media outlets have taken hold of these cases because it's no longer a military issue. The world is watching and the military story is finally getting the face time it deserves because serving your country doesn't make you any less of a victim if you are murdered by a comrade. So I am taking a little break this week from my normal one story at a time format, and I'm going to bring you the top 10 military murder stories of this year. So I'm only going to discuss murders that took place in the year 2020. Some of these cases I have covered in depth in a full prior episode. Some I have not, but I may in the future. I'm only going to discuss snippets of the case where I give you the case highlights. So without any further delay, let's dig in. Shooting at Grand Forks Air Force Base left two airmen dead this morning, according to a release from the Air Force Base. The airmen accused of murdering a New Mexico Sunday school teacher. We'll find out whether... Woman he- and four children ranging in age from four years to 11 months old. Drum found- soldier from Tennessee who has been found dead. Authorities now say they and do new believe... tonight, we've learned a Newport News native died in a crash in Texas last weekend. During the search for Houston soldier Vanessa Guillen, the remains of another soldier were found near Fort Hood. Today, the Army released the results of its review of the culture at Fort Hood. It was triggered by Vanessa Guillen's disappearance and murder. The Army Secretary announced an unprecedented four... Number 10, murder, suicide. In June of 2020, the country was rocked by the murder suicide of a San Antonio family of six. Yes, you heard me correctly, a family of six. When active duty Army Sergeant Jared Esquivel Harless failed to report to do a virtual check in for work, they went a knocking at his Stone Oak community home, and something wasn't right. A cryptic note was on the door, and police were called in. And when they read the note, they quickly entered the home, but were hit with a harsh, noxious fume smell. So they evacuated, believing the home was booby-trapped. They cleared the area and eventually entered the home, only to discover the entire Harless family sitting in their family vehicle, all dead. The husband, the wife, and the four kids, ages four, three, one, and 11 months old. In addition to the family, the family pets, two cats, were also deceased. Initially thought to be a murder-suicide where one parent killed the other parent and then the kids, in August of 2020, further investigation revealed that the children were murdered by both parents and the parents then committed suicide. However, in December of 2020, Express News reported that the autopsy revealed that while the parents died of carbon monoxide poisoning, the cause of death of the four children is undetermined, which only adds to the mystery. While everyone wants answers, there is no known motive for the murder-suicide, although the San Antonio PD spokesperson has said that it could involve, quote, a combination of life stress that was exacerbated by some mental health issues and the stress that is not uncommon with having children with special needs as well, end quote. Jared, the father, was 38 years old and assigned to the 470th Military Intelligence Brigade, Joint Base San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston in Texas. A murder-suicide that rocked the Air Force in 2020 occurred in Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. 
On June 1, 2020, a spokesperson from Grand Forks revealed that two young airmen were dead in the dorms, but they were not looking for any suspects in connection with the deaths, which right off the bat made everyone realize it was probably a murder-suicide or likely a murder-suicide. It was revealed that the two deceased airmen were 21-year-old Airman First Class Natasha Aposian and 20-year-old Airman First Class Julian Carlos Torres. Natasha's parents, reeling from the loss of their beautiful daughter, quickly revealed that Natasha was murdered in a domestic violence incident. It turns out that Natasha and Julian had been seeing each other when Natasha called it quits the weekend before she was murdered. She confided in her parents that she was afraid he would kill her. And while she did tell a friend she was going to obtain a protective order, she changed her mind earlier the day she was murdered because she said Julian seemed to be taking the breakup much better than she expected. Hours later, though, she would be dead at the hands of the man she feared. And while a murder-suicide is sometimes open and shut, no one is ever held responsible because the person who is responsible is dead. However, in late July of 2020, another airman at the base would be arrested for obtaining the illegal gun for 20-year-old Julian, the same gun that later killed Natasha and which he then turned on himself. The airman was Daisha Hurd. She was arrested and charged with unlawful purchase and transfer of a firearm and making false statements. The Air Force, however, requested jurisdiction of the case, and the Air Force will now be prosecuting the case against Hurd. The week of Christmas 2020 was not a quiet one for murder suicide cases around the military, and one in particular caught everyone's attention, and it was out of Fort Bragg. On Sunday, December 20th, as reported by the New York Post, 31-year-old Staff Sergeant Keith Lewis shot and killed his wife, veteran Sarah Lewis, in their home on the 900 block of Willow Street in Fayetteville. Sarah was due to give birth to her fourth child and Keith's second child five days later on Christmas. So Sarah was very much pregnant. But to make matters worse, it is said that Keith killed his wife in front of his three-year-old daughter. Keith was a combat medic assigned to the 98th Civil Affairs Battalion, 95th Civil Affairs Brigade, Fort Bragg in North Carolina. It is reported that Keith suffered from PTSD and that he became extremely violent when he drank. Number nine, the murder of five-year-old Austin Birdseye. 35-year-old Army Sergeant First Class Brian Starr could not get the five-year-old son of his girlfriend to calm down on an evening in late November. So he decided to put the child into the car to, quote, calm him down. Brian drove around, and when he was about two miles from the home, the boy, five-year-old Austin Birdseye, became, quote, unruly, end quote. So Brian pulled his car off into a church parking lot off of the highway he had been driving on, and he told the boy to get out. Mind you, it was 8 p.m., dark and raining. The boy got out, and it's unclear what Brian did next. Did he drive off and circle the lot? Did he stay in the spot? Or did he do something else? We don't know. All we know is that when he looked back to find Austin, Austin was gone. Then, all of a sudden, Brian saw cars on the highway begin to stop. And when he went over to take a look, he realized Austin had been hit by a passing motorist who didn't see the boy in the middle of the street. The boy was taken to the hospital where he was declared dead. While Brian was questioned and let go, he was subsequently charged with reckless murder. Austin is survived by his mother and his twin brother. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past. 
ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Number eight, Corporal Te U. 27-year-old Corporal Te U is assigned as an admin specialist with the Marine Corps Intelligence School at Dam Neck Naval Base. According to an article published by Task and Purpose on April 5, 2020, Corporal Te U allegedly used a key to enter her then-boyfriend's house located in Virginia Beach. It appears that she may have actually shared this house with him, but it's unclear. Her entrance is caught on surveillance video. Then Te enters a home and is heard screaming at the boyfriend and shouting, quote, I'm gonna kill you, end quote. Then she allegedly goes to the kitchen to retrieve a knife. She goes towards the room where the boyfriend is now hiding with the door shut, and Tay allegedly begins to repeatedly stab the door. Tay is later apprehended, taken to an inpatient facility, and charged with attempted murder. Of course, because of the gravity of the case and probably the boyfriend feeling uneasy about the situation, there was a protective order instructing her not to see her boyfriend. After she was released from inpatient treatment, she allegedly promptly violated the order by text messaging him and then returning to her boyfriend's house and breaking into his home. I do not know what happened in the home or if the boyfriend was even there, but what we do know is that sometime in mid-June, Tay is taken to the Navy Consolidated Brig in Chesapeake, where she is currently in pretrial confinement. Tay and her family have been pleading for help. Tay says that she was sexually assaulted while in Okinawa, Japan back in 2015 by a fellow Marine who now works for legal services. She reported the assault in 2018 and has been asking for help ever since. She was diagnosed in 2018 with post-traumatic stress disorder, and she claims that her outburst in April of this year was a result of a change of her medication. But the Marines have still decided to pursue charges. Her now ex-boyfriend has asked not to pursue charges in which he is the named victim. But as of right now, her trial for attempted murder is scheduled to take place in March. Tay Uwe has been revealed has also attempted suicide roughly three times since her 2015 rape. During the military Article 32, a.k.a. the preliminary hearing, which took place in August, as reported by Task and Purpose, the military prosecutor indicated that in July of 2020, after she had been in pretrial confinement for a few weeks, Tay was taken to a mental health facility where she began swinging restraints, quote, as a weapon, end quote, and shattered a window. She also allegedly folded up a mattress in her cell to add some height so she could stand on it and look out the window. When the guard told her to cut it out, she allegedly threatened to kill the guard. There is a Facebook page created for hashtag justice for Tae where her family keeps everyone updated on the case. And in an interesting turn of events, in November, the Marine Corps requested a gag order to keep everyone involved in the case from talking to the media. Number seven, a double murder at Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg, Fort Bragg, Fort Bragg. Oh, how they have found themselves in the media lately. And this next story stems from a December 4th Army Times article written by Howard Altman. On December 2nd, 2020, Fort Bragg released a statement to the public informing that two bodies were discovered in a Fort Bragg training area, but the deaths were not related to official training. So this left it up to everyone's imagination. Was it a murder-suicide? And the answer would come the following day when the two bodies were identified, along with the message that foul play was in fact suspected. No murder weapons were found at the scene, but shell casings were found. And to top it off, the two deceased men were under investigation for using and selling drugs at the time of their murder. What the what? The two men were 44-year-old military veteran Timothy Dumas and 37-year-old Master Sergeant William Levine II. 
Dumas served in the army for 20 years as a property accounting technician. He got out of the military in 2016. Levine had also served nearly 20 years by the time of his death. He was assigned to the headquarters and headquarters company Army Special Operations Command at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. In any event, the case is still under investigation, but Levine's story is more interesting than it appears at first blush. Army Times revealed that Levine had been involved in two fatal shootings in March of 2018. The first incident occurred in Cumberland County, and Levine allegedly shot and killed a Green Beret during an altercation. Later, it was revealed that Levine's actions in causing the Green Beret's death was justifiable homicide. That same month, while at a house in Fayetteville with his friend, Levine shot and killed his friend, another Army soldier, Sergeant First Class Mark Leshikar. This shooting was also ruled justifiable homicide. However, according to Leshikar's sister, Levine had explained to her once that he shot her brother because her brother came at him with a screwdriver. But Leshikar's sister says there was no screwdriver found at the scene of her brother's murder. The double murder at Fort Bragg is still unsolved. Number six, Fort Bliss. I've been keeping my eye on Fort Bliss ever since a soldier went missing there this summer. It appears that this summer was a summer of missing soldiers, which is really spooky considering this wasn't a very common occurrence in the past. Usually someone is listed as AWOL and the media isn't really privy to it. But on August 28, 2020, Robert Holiday, the father of a concerned soldier, called up his son's unit at Fort Bliss to ask about his son. He hadn't heard from him in a while and Richard wasn't returning his calls. That's when the army told Robert, oh, really? Well, that's interesting because we haven't seen or heard from him since July 23rd. Mr. and Mrs. Holiday must have just about fallen out of their chairs because that was 36 days prior to this phone call. Why hadn't anyone called to report he was missing? Apparently, the army says they had attempted to get a hold of them, but were unsuccessful. That being said, by the time Mr. Holiday called, 21-year-old Richard Holiday was already listed as an army deserter in the books. Mrs. Holiday, Patricia, revealed that she knew her son was unhappy with the army ever since he returned from an assignment to Qatar, and he had plans to get out. But it wasn't until she reached his leadership that she learned that Richard had recently been in trouble for drunk driving in January and for illegally crossing into Mexico in March, which apparently is against the rules. It is unclear what happened to Richard, and the search continues. According to the Daily Mail, the search has included 200 soldiers searching through more than 200 miles of trails at Franklin Mountain National Park. They've also sent out human remains canine dogs to search a four-mile stretch at McKellen Canyon and some homeless areas in El Paso. And in October, they searched across the border into Juarez, Mexico. Richard Holiday is a white male, five foot nine inches tall and weighs about 162 pounds. He has black hair and hazel eyes. And I'll post a picture of him on my social media so you all know what he looks like and you can be on the lookout. There is a $25,000 reward for information leading to Richard's whereabouts. If you have any information, you can contact Fort Bliss CID at 915-568-1700. And just when you thought things couldn't get any crazier at Fort Bliss, it does. Things get super crazy. I covered this next case on episode 50. So if you want to hear the whole thing, go back and take a listen. Well, on October 11th of this year, a few Fort Bliss captains were out painting the town red when they got into a little scuffle. The captains were not initially together, but they were Captain Malcolm Perry and Captain Clevy Mouchette Nelson Royster. Apparently, the pair had been an on-again, off-again couple for five years, but on this particular night, they were not out together. After getting kicked out of a bar, Clevy decided to visit a strip club with her friend, Richard Senese. Upon arriving at the Jaguars nightclub, Clevy and Malcolm bumped into each other and got into it. Unsure who started it, although the altercation is apparently caught on video surveillance and Clevy was kicked out of the club. Malcolm got into his car and drove home. He lived in a gated community, so he drove through the gates and then parked. But he sat in his car for a few minutes. He didn't realize that his ex-girlfriend, Clevy, 
had instructed her male companion to drive her Jeep through the gated gates to gain access to Malcolm's parking lot. When Malcolm got out of the car to go home, he was allegedly jumped. Stories differ on who jumped him. Clevy said it was a group of guys and that she was trying to break it up. Other accounts say she was the one throwing hands. Well, Malcolm broke free, returned to the car and drove off. This set off a high-speed chase that resulted in Richard smashing Clevy's Jeep into the back of Malcolm's Audi, causing Malcolm's car to roll over where it caught fire and exploded with Malcolm inside. Malcolm later died. Richard made a run for it while Clevy waited for cops to arrive. Initially thought to be a terrible traffic accident, the truth was later revealed, and Clevy and Richard were charged with Malcolm's murder. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. Number five, the murder of Fort Drum soldier Hayden Allen Harris. A week before Christmas this year, a Fort Drum soldier specialist Hayden Allen Harris was last seen at Fort Drum. That Thursday night, Hayden had plans to meet up with someone about a car thing. By Friday morning, no one had seen or heard from Hayden, so he was reported missing, and the search for yet another missing soldier this year began in upstate New York. Meanwhile, that Saturday, 300 miles south of Fort Drum, New York, a small town in New Jersey, Byram Township, was beginning to celebrate Christmas. They were doing a socially distanced Santa visit to the residents, and Santa was atop a fire truck while Santa handed out candy canes to all of the local children. During their rounds, a keen-eyed firefighter observed a random shoe and some papers floating about at the end of a cul-de-sac on Ross Road. Upon closer examination, there was blood, so the firefighter called the cops. The cops arrived and they inspected the nearby area behind the home where the shoe and blood were found. And there, in the snow, they found Hayden's body. He had been shot to death. The news quickly made its way back to Fort Drum and an investigation ensued. And it wouldn't be long until another Fort Drum soldier by the name of Jamal Mellish would be arrested for Hayden's murder. According to the Sussex County, New Jersey prosecutor, it is believed that Jamal and Hayden had a disagreement over a car exchange. And then Jamal kidnapped Hayden while in Watertown, New York, drove him down to New Jersey where he killed him in the woods. Jamal is pending murder and kidnapping charges in New Jersey. After his death, Hayden was posthumously promoted to corporal. Number four, the cop who may be a cop killer, Stephen Carrillo. On June 6th of this year, a story broke. A few good Samaritans had captured a man believed to be on the run from police for ambushing two cops who arrived at his home to investigate a suspicious white van registered to the homeowner. Here's the cell phone recorded sound footage from that heroic capture. Please, you guys! 
Hey, please. we are holding him on the ground right here. There's a gun, please. Please, come on, I'm a RN, public health nurse, come on, you guys. He's gonna get up, there's only two people holding him down. Somebody, please come help with handcuffs. I don't know, there might be a second person, I don't know. Get back, get behind cover. He's on the ground. He's on the ground. And the machine gun or the rifle, whatever, is right over here. Get behind cover. No, no, we don't. Well, the man that had been apprehended was Air Force Staff Sergeant Stephen Carrillo a security forces member, a.k.a. an Air Force cop, stationed at Travis Air Force Base in California. Earlier that day, a different Good Samaritan had spotted a suspicious white van that didn't have a license plate on it and upon closer examination, appeared to have weapons and explosive devices inside. The person did jot down the van VIN number before calling the cops. The cops ran the VIN and the van was registered to a M.L. Carrillo that lived in Ben Lomond, California. A patrol car paid a visit to the registered van owner, and upon approaching the home, they saw a newer model white van parked in front of the home. When police exited their car and approached the house located at 120 Waldberg Road, they were ambushed with gunfire and explosive devices. Two cops were injured, one of them later succumbing to his injuries. The man inside, Air Force Staff Sergeant Stephen Carrillo, made a run for it, although he was injured. Down the road, he carjacked the van and took off, later abandoning the car. He attempted another carjacking, but was not successful. He was quickly spotted by a police officer, but he was hauling booty. Unsure why or how Good Samaritans got involved, but he is taken down and his homemade AR-15 was taken by the Good Samaritans as they attempted to get police to come help cuff the guy. While Stephen was connected to the June 6 murder of that police officer, he is also alleged to be connected to another police shooting a week earlier in Oakland, California, when a person inside a white van opened fire on two police officers sitting in a guard shack guarding the federal courthouse during a Black Lives Matter demonstration. This case is very involved and I covered it in more depth in my December episode of Military Primetime available to fan club members. Number three, the murder of Sasha Kraus. In January of 2020, a 27-year-old Mennonite teacher by the name of Sasha Kraus vanished from her small church community outside Farmington, New Mexico. She was reported missing almost immediately since it was out of character for Sasha to not return home, especially not when she only went on a quick errand and never returned home. A month later, Sasha's body was discovered almost 300 miles from where she was last seen. She was found in Flagstaff, Arizona. A woman was visiting the Sunset Crater Visitor Center when she was gathering firewood when she saw Sasha's body in the brush. Sasha had been shot in the back of the head and her hands were tied with duct tape. While she was still wearing her traditional Mennonite long dress, she did not have any underwear, nor was she wearing her headpiece. And while investigators looked into the case, everyone wondered what kind of monster would do such a thing. Meanwhile, nearly 300 miles south of the Sunset Crater, Luke Air Force Base, a base located near Phoenix, Arizona, was trying to cope with the new COVID-19 pandemic reality. When in April, a Luke Airman was arrested for the January kidnapping and murder of Sasha Krause. Say what now? How could that be? That Airman was 21-year-old Mark Gooch. Turns out Mark Gooch was connected to Sasha Krause's murder after it was discovered that his phone pinged off the same tower that Sasha's did before her phone was turned off after she went missing. Investigators also discovered that Mark Gooch had been at the Sunset Crater when Sasha went missing. And further disturbing information from his phone revealed he had been surveilling Mennonites for a while, 
as reported by KRQE News 13 Albuquerque. And if things couldn't get any crazier, the Arizona Central reported that Mark Gooch grew up in a Mennonite family in Wisconsin and told authorities that he joined the military to escape a difficult, sheltered, and restricted life. Well, his murder trial is scheduled for three weeks in August of 2021, and I guess if he's convicted, he will have joined the military for naught, since he will continue to live a difficult, sheltered, and restricted life in prison, possibly for the rest of his life. So, there's that. Number two, the murder of Enrique Roman Martinez. Fort Bragg is on the countdown for the third time today. The missing persons case of Enrique Roman Martinez broke during Memorial Day weekend in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Enrique and seven other Army soldiers, six men and one woman, all assigned to Fort Bragg, had decided to go camping during the long weekend. They arrived on Friday and by evening it was a windy night on the shore. The following day at about 7 p.m., the group of seven soldiers reported Enrique missing. During the 911 call obtained and heard for the first time on this podcast on episode 35, take a listen if you want to hear the full thing, a male soldier is heard saying that he doesn't know what happened to Enrique. He walked off at midnight and no one knew where he was going. When the rest of the campers woke up in the morning and they didn't see him, they investigated Enrique's tent and Enrique wasn't there, but he had left behind all of his belongings, including his glasses. The caller also nonchalantly mentions that Enrique was depressed, almost as if setting up a scenario where Enrique may have left to maybe commit suicide. Well, as I was tracking the case, I read an article where a park ranger recalls seeing the seven soldiers minus Enrique earlier on Saturday. The ranger stopped to tell them to correct the manner in which they were parked. None of the soldiers took this opportunity to ask the ranger for help in finding their missing buddy. And this was contrary to the 911 call where the caller indicated they had been looking for help all day and couldn't quite figure out how to get any. In any event, a week after Enrique went missing, it was reported that human remains belonging to Enrique had been discovered on the shore of Shackleford Beach, which is where the soldiers had been camping. Enrique's manner of death was under investigation as a murder, although the public didn't know anything else besides that the remains had been identified using dental records. Enrique's murder is still a mystery and unsolved, even though it has been well over six months since he was murdered. And in an interesting turn of events, although Enrique was murdered in May and discovered in May, the results of his autopsy were not released until December 2020. The cause of death is listed as homicide by undetermined means, And this becomes much more clear in examining the results of the autopsy when it is revealed that the only part the medical examiner had to examine was Enrique's severed head. What? Yes, there was no torso, no extremities, no nothing else. This meant that the only part of Enrique that washed ashore a week after his disappearance was his head. Additionally, under diagnosis, The autopsy lists, quote, evidence of multiple chop injuries of the head, end quote. In the summary and interpretation section of the autopsy, it says, and I'm going to read this verbatim, quote, while decapitation is in and of itself universally fatal, the remainder of the body in this case was not available for examination and therefore potential causes of death involving the torso and extremities cannot be excluded, end quote. And while any other medical examiner may have taken the easy route and listed Enrique's manner of death as undetermined, this ME stated, quote, while a definitive cause of death cannot be determined, the findings in this case are more consistent with death due to homicide, end quote. And with that, it appears the search for Enrique's killer or killers intensified as ABC7 reported on December 10, 2020, that dive teams together with Army CID and the FBI evidence recovery team were back searching near where Enrique's severed head was recovered, searching for clues or evidence that might lead to more information. Enrique's family really wants justice for the young army soldier who loved serving his country. A $25,000 reward is available for any information that leads to the apprehension and conviction of the person or persons 
involved in Enrique's murder. If you have any information, however insignificant you think that may be, please come forward. Maybe a soldier was popping off while drunk during a 4th of July party, or maybe someone made an insensitive joke about Enrique after his death. This could lead to some legitimate information. And if you have that information, please contact Army CID at 910-396-8777. You can also submit an anonymous tip at p3tips.com. Number one, Fort Hood. The April disappearance of a young female soldier, Vanessa Guillen, may be the military murder case to bring all military murder discussions to the forefront of military true crime. In late April of 2020, then Private First Class Vanessa Guillen reported to work at the arms room at Fort Hood. She was allegedly asked to come into work that day, although she was not scheduled to work. She arrived at the armory and was doing her thing when she received a message from another army soldier who worked at a different arms room and asked her to come retrieve something. Vanessa took her cell phone and left everything else behind, including her military ID card. Vanessa was never seen again. Later that afternoon, when Vanessa's sister Myra didn't hear from her, she became concerned. Call it sister's intuition or something else. Myra got wind that no one had seen Vanessa and she decided to make the three-hour trek to Fort Hood, Texas from her hometown of Houston. Myra arrived early the next morning and was met with skepticism and really not much of anything besides that her sister was nowhere to be found. Maybe the army believed that the Guillen family would go quietly, not demanding more information on their missing 20-year-old daughter. But if they thought that, they would be wrong because the family, while small, they are mighty. I recall hearing about weekly demonstrations in front of one of the Fort Hood gates. Mama Guillen, the Guillen sisters, and a few people here and there, never appearing to be any more than 20 people at best, would unite at the gate with signs asking, have you seen my Vanessa Guillen? Small local media outlets appeared to be drawn to the demonstrations, but they always sent their B team and it always just seemed like a hot mess. But the Guillen family took any and every opportunity to talk about Vanessa Guillen, never wasting a single minute. And their efforts paid off. Their demonstrations, together with the social media campaign led by the Guillen sisters, Vanessa Guillen has now become a household name across the U.S., and this is among military families and non-military families alike. Eventually, after a long-fought battle, Texas EquiSearch got involved, and together with other agencies, authorities began to search near the Leon River, outside of the Fort Hood base, for what appeared to be a body. They kept mom as to their reasons for searching the Leon River, but it wouldn't be long until it was revealed that human remains were discovered and it was the human remains of missing soldier Vanessa Guillen. Army CID had a culprit in mind, Specialist Aaron Robinson, the soldier who Vanessa was en route to see when she vanished. But when they caught up with Specialist Robinson, he was able to get away, eventually turning the gun on himself and committing suicide. The truth allegedly did not die with Robinson as his girlfriend, Cecily Aguilar, knew a thing or two about what happened to Vanessa. Turns out Aaron had asked Vanessa to come to his arms room where he bludgeoned her to death with a hammer. He stuffed her in a large plastic tough box used to store large items. He cleaned up and returned later that same day where he retrieved the box containing Vanessa's remains. While he was putting the box into his car, two witnesses saw him struggling to get the box in the car, but they didn't immediately come forward with this information. Robinson then picked Cecily up where they drove close to the Leon River to dispose of Vanessa's body. It took them two trips to do what they were going to do, but they ended up dismembering Vanessa's body and they attempted to burn her remains. When that didn't work, they scattered her remains among three separate holes and then they poured cement over the remains. They almost got away with murder because investigators had actually searched the area where Vanessa had been buried but the cement covered the remains so well. But they did eventually find her, even though they missed it the first time. Cecily was charged for her part in assisting to dispose of Vanessa's body, and she is currently facing up to 20 years if convicted. I cover Vanessa's case in more depth on episodes 31 and 37 if you want more information on this case. 
The Guillen family continues to fight for justice for Vanessa Guillen because while nothing will ever bring Vanessa back, her story has encouraged other military personnel to come forward with their own stories of sexual harassment and sexual assault at the hands of other military members. And I did forget to mention this earlier, but weeks after Vanessa went missing, it was revealed that Vanessa had been sexually harassed at Fort Hood, allegedly by soldiers and even Robinson, but she had never come forward to her leadership for fear of retribution. But Vanessa's story isn't the only one out of Fort Hood. In fact, Vanessa's story and the strength of her family's voice inadvertently helped to find another missing soldier, Gregory Morales. Gregory Morales was stationed at Fort Hood and was weeks away from separating from the military. He had just purchased a car and everything when he mysteriously went missing in August of 2019. However, leadership at Fort Hood didn't bat an eye and listed him as AWOL, eventually changing his status to deserter a month after he failed to report to work. Gregory's mother also attempted to tell people something happened to my son. He wouldn't just disappear, but her cries fell on deaf ears. And during the search for Vanessa, the investigation led them to a park outside of Fort Hood where human remains later identified as Gregory Morales were ultimately found. Originally, the army did not want to give Gregory's family any death benefits because it was unclear how or when he died. The army allegedly claimed it was possible that Gregory died after voluntarily going AWOL. But after much scrutiny and an autopsy, Gregory's family were provided the benefits they deserved. And the list of deceased soldiers at Fort Hood in 2020 is horrifying. Here is a short list of some others and a brief statement of the facts. As reported by KWTX, on March 1st, Shelby Jones was shot at a strip club and later died. Freddie Beningo de la Cruz Jr. was shot and killed a few weeks later on March 18th. He was found dead at the Summerlin Apartments in Killeen after someone reported a leak. Together with him was his pregnant girlfriend and another man, all murdered. The alleged perpetrator was arrested five months later. On May 18th, Private First Class Brandon Rosecrans was shot and killed. His car was found a little bit away from where he was found and was engulfed in flames. An alleged perpetrator for his murder was arrested in August. Private Mayor Morta allegedly drowned on July 17th near Stillhouse Hollow Lake, although he was discovered wearing all of his clothing, so it's unclear what could have happened. And two weeks later, on August 2nd, Specialist Francisco Gilberto Hernandez Vargas drowned at Temple Lake Park. A few weeks after that, on August 19th, Elder Fernandez was released from a mental health institution and he didn't return to work. A week later, his body was discovered hanging from a tree 30 minutes from his home, outside of the base. Even though his car was parked at Fort Hood, his death was ruled a suicide. And my research indicates that combined, Fort Hood's 2020 murder, suicide, and fatal accidents rate is reaching 30 soldiers. During the summer of 2020, an independent review of Fort Hood's command climate and culture was ordered by the Secretary of the Army. And while all the skeptics expected a large broom would be sweeping all of the leadership failures under the rug, the final report released in December did just the opposite. The 152-page report revealed some pretty terrifying shortcomings. And because this is the top 10 murder stories episode, and Fort Hood is number one, you might be interested in knowing that the independent report revealed some very frightening revelations about the Army CID program at Fort Hood. According to the Army Times, the report said that agents at Fort Hood were inexperienced, under-resourced, and understaffed. And above all else, the lack of stability among agents made it difficult to get anything accomplished. Ultimately, the result of the report led to 14 U.S. Army soldiers either being fired or suspended, which is at least a start. The Secretary of the Army also revealed that the Army now has a new policy on missing soldiers. Now, instead of listing a soldier as absent without leave, a.k.a. AWOL, right away, they have a new status, absent unknown. The soldier is placed on absent unknown status for the first 48 hours where they're missing. The status then is either changed to, quote, missing or AWOL. But a commander can only place a soldier on AWOL status if the commander can show that the absence is voluntary. (music) 
that just about wraps up 2020 in a nutshell. When thinking about how to end the year, I figured you all might be interested in a year in review type episode. So I leave you with that. Be sure to follow me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast and join the Facebook discussion group at facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime. If you liked what you heard, be sure to stop and rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts before going on with your day. It takes only one minute and I truly appreciate it. Shout out to my newest dotted line supporters, Darla R, Jasmine P, Christopher C, Tara M, Shay P, Esmeralda G, Elizabeth C, Nina G, Cassie P, Kelly, and Stacy. The show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my newest assistant producers, Mary G, Samantha M, Oran J S, and Cecilia G. And my newest associate producer is Stevie W. The executive producer is Falcon 13, and the music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next year. Shh, let's work another podcast.